<coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Darcy Gilly, as you can see there. Um, I used to be an archaeologist. Um, I was last an archaeologist maybe 14 or 15 years ago before I successfully made the transition to something else. Um, I'm the careers consultant for researchers at the University of Sheffield. Um, and I still maintain an interest in archaeology, which is why I saw the call for papers for this conference. And I want to, you know, thank you for coming this morning to listen to me. And um, I feel grateful to be here because one of the things that I did think about when I saw the failure is failure thing is as a, as a careers consultant, people often think that me and my colleagues are the CV covering and interview ladies. And I've actually been called that. Um, but what we do is much, much more. I really see my work as helping people find satisfying and fulfilling careers. And oftentimes what individuals bring into the room to discuss with me are their failures. So I sort of felt that I perhaps had something interesting and worthwhile to come and say to you this morning. Um, as you'll see by the end, I'm happy for you to disagree or comment or otherwise. Um, I don't learn anything if people don't disagree and debate with me. Um, in the back, can you hear what I'm saying? That's good, because let, can, can you just let me know if I, I'm trying really hard to project. I'm trying so hard. Um, so I, I did want to apologize because when, I, when I, I was in a bit of a rush to do this abstract and I called it failure, you're doing it wrong. And I thought that was quite arrogant because I discovered I'm doing it wrong too. Um, so we're all in this together. Um, so I just want to start up today by saying what this talk is not going to do. Um, and I'm not assuming anybody came here today because they necessarily want to change your life. Um, but it's not going to happen in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and I think, as implied by the font size on my previous slide, you know, failure is a big topic. And even today, we're looking at all sorts of facets and dimensions of failure. Um, and I, so today, I've had to choose a path. I've had to choose something to follow. Um, and what I did was I chose something that I hope may be of most immediate help to people, um, to individuals who are seeking to maybe recover from mistakes or failures real or perceived in everyday life. Um, so I think there are paths we cannot follow today are things like exploring some of the structural barriers and conditions that I think no amount of just try harder or work more um, can surmount. And these are the areas where perhaps resistance is likely to be of more practical use than resilience. But again, I think that's, that's a big topic and it requires attention on its own. And I think, ironically, what drove me to come today is, if you look at my abstract, is this kind of, um, my frustration with this kind of immediate self-help industry of, um, who promised to change your life in 15 minutes, as though, again, assuming your life needs changing, um, or who promise you that you can gain confidence or that you can overcome failure in seven easy steps. Um, so I do want to say that if we do want to change profound areas of our existence, like confidence, coping with failure, anxiety, it takes time, it takes commitment, it takes genuine self-awareness, and it takes the support of people around us. Um, so, what are we going to do? Um, this is what I hope to do today, is that by the end of it, although having a feeling, I have a feeling, as this often happens listening to conversations, I have a slight feeling I'm preaching to the converted today. So I still hope you'll find something to take away from this. Um, what I'm offering you are some threads. Um, some of them are ones that I've used myself. Some I use to help students and researchers to help them find their way out of the labyrinth. Um, but these, what I'm presenting is not the only way. This is Darcy Gillies' approach to dealing with failure. Um, you may find your own way. Um, and I, I encourage you to pick, choose, find your own way. Um, and if anybody would like a list of references and other articles that I've used, I've got my email at the end, so please do send me an email. I'm happy to share that with you. Um, does that sound OK? okay. Um, one thing that might not be OK is I'm, I'm not going to talk at you for 15 or 20 minutes. There is a bit with audience participation in the middle. Um, so now's your chance to run away. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Um, so when I was putting together this talk, my first instinct was to go back to first principles and try and understand the essence of failure. 
which I'm not going to talk about because it actually contradicts the title of this session. So if you want to ask me about that later, we can talk about it. Um, but I also wanted to put it in the context of archaeological research and archaeological thinking. Um, and I, I went back and I studied two cases. Um, one was something called the Renamo Runes, um, which does, has anybody heard of the Renamo Runes and the great scandal of Danish archaeology in the 19th century? Fantastic. You can all do some homework later. Um, it was basically a failure of archaeological interpretation that last started in the 13th century and lasted till the middle of the 19th century. And I became very caught up with the characters in that. Um, a bit more tangential, but more <coughs> recent, is... Have you all heard of the Piltdown chicken? Maybe? Possibly? Okay. Um, the reason I picked this as a case study to kind of do my, my explorations of failure is when I was reading a review of the Piltdown chicken fiasco in Scientific American, I was completely arrested by this description of what happened. And it, it resonated with me because it resonated with my sense that our biggest failure in dealing with failure is actually focusing on the failure focusing on the externals. Um, as the philosopher Michael Desmond says, and we're going to encounter him a little bit later, um, we will always and inevitably fail, fail. And I've heard other people say that today. Failure is a given. Um, so this description reminded me that we're human and we're full of evolutionary emotions that we develop to help us cope with hostile environments to help us survive and thrive in hostile environments. So what I find that advice about coping with failure is often missing is an account of emotions. Um, no more. Okay. Um, has anybody in the room, or does anybody want to publicly admit to ever having loved someone or something? Okay. Has anybody here ever loved someone or something? Okay. Um, <coughs> what does it feel like? How does that feeling of love for someone or something influence your perspective on life in general, not just the object of that love? How does it alter your interactions with other people? And how does loving something or someone affect your work? So a lot of big questions there, which we're not going to explore today. I wouldn't be asking them if I didn't think they were important. Yeah, the call the, the microphone. To uh, the uh, yeah, don't worry about it. Okay, no, I, I think it? I'm doing okay. Uh, no, <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, well, no, do fine. you want me to stop? No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. Should I stop? No. Let me stop and let him. Can come back? Can we come back later? Um, we're in the middle of get. She's in the middle of getting a paper. Would it be possible if you come back in about ten minutes? Ten yeah, minutes? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's okay. Come back later. Um. So what I'd like you to do now is, in your mind, pick an emotion, any emotion. It could be love, anger, fear, joy, surprise, ecstasy, grief, trust. Okay, take that emotion. Um, we're going to take two minutes, okay? Um, one minute each. I want you to find a partner. And with your partner, I'd like you to discuss what does that word mean to you? What are the associations you make with that word? If anybody's ever played word associations, and how does it feel? What's your actual embodied response to that word? Okay. So if we go for two minutes, one minute each, starting now. Later on, um, sorry, and I do want to thank you for participating. Um, so I want. I mean, Sorry. I'm trying to squish a lot into this, so I feel like I'm jumping around a bit, but our professional lives are emotional places, okay? And emotions contribute to organizational dynamics. Having and displaying emotions at work can be healthy, and I really like this here for anybody who's in a kind of supervisory or leadership position or being a supervisor or leader. Leadership at its core, argue Ashkenazi et al. in Emotions in the Workplace, is about managing emotions. So we think about it a lot as managing processes and systems and people, but they say it's actually about managing the emotions of people. So my position is that we need to think about the emotional component of our careers and work. And I thought that failure was a useful place to start that consideration. And before I came here today, I actually I had a meeting, I, I had coffee with a philosopher of language to discuss this idea of this essence of failure. Um, and 
in, in contradiction to this, we decided actually the problem is not the definition of failure. We don't need to change the definition of failure. Because you can think in a, a lot of context, okay, if you fail, um, it's not a sign of innovation. Um, it doesn't put you on the path of success. I'm a mountaineer. Um, if I fail, it puts me on quite a different path <laughs> altogether. <laughs> and it might enable me to innovate, but not in a good way. Um, so, um, so the issue we decided is not this definition of failure, but perhaps the associations that we make with it, which make us averse to, to coping with it in different ways. So I looked at the things that people say when they come to me for a one-to-one -one appointment and they talk about their failures. And I did a little bit of canvassing. <coughs> and there are lots of things that come out, regret, confusion, anger, embarrassment, guilt. But most of all, people talk about shame. And they talk about how failure leads them to have this overwhelming feeling of shame. So there are a lot of things I could talk about today, but for the rest of the time that we have less left, I'm going to focus on shame. And again, I don't know if this is because I used to be an etymologist in a prior career as well, but I like to look at the meaning of things. Um, so I looked at different philosophers' definitions of shame, and you can see them here. And I want to kind of expand a little bit more on Schwader's, because he said, shame is, it is the anxious experience of either the real or anticipated loss of status, affection, of self-regard, that results from knowing one is vulnerable to the disapproving gaze or negative judgment of others. It is a terror that touches the mind, the body, and the soul, precisely because one is aware that one might be seen to have come up short in relationship to some shared or uncontested ideal that defines what it means to be good, worthy, admirable, and a competent person. And I thought of two things there. I went back to our, our Danish archaeologist and our Piltdown chicken people, and I thought about the emotional precipices to which these people were driven by themselves, by other people in their lives. Um, so we do this to ourselves. Other people drive us. And also, this is a bit uncomfortable, but there are situations where maybe we drive other people to this precipice too. Um, so with that in mind, um, I do want to briefly digress at the moment because each of us here have the power to change the context in which failure operates, not just for ourselves, but in being compassionate to other people. Um, and I d I'm not talking about niceness here. Nice is that I'm American. Nice is that superficial, have a nice day kind of thing, which you forget, and it leaves no trace in your life. Kindness, and I'll use an example here for my mountaineering, is the mountain guide who saw me struggling up a route over a crevasse glacier snout, plod across the glacier, and he greeted me at the hut door with a bowl of hot sweet tea and lemon, and he said, I watched you coming, and I thought this might help. And that's empathy and kindness, a real ability to put himself in my shoes and see what I was feeling. And we all have that ability to watch our colleagues at work, watch our friends, watch our family, put ourselves in their shoes and offer them not tea and sympathy, but empathy and kindness. Um, so failure, how do we do it better? And I'm going to zoom through this. Um, uh, there are four dimensions to failure to our failure, to our success. We're not focusing on success today, we're just looking at failure. Um, and I'm really gonna focus on global failure. So the first one there is more likely to lead to feelings of guilt, okay? And guilt is great because it gives us an opportunity to discharge. It gives us an opportunity to confess. So you've all got your bit of paper here where you can confess. This is fantastic. <laughs> okay, you should get one. <laughs> um, so guilt is about a bad thing that you did, okay? Um, shame is about the self, all right? It's a result of a negative evaluation of who we are. Um, so you can see it's, it's easy to stop doing things. If you're stealing your colleague's milk and you feel guilty about it, you can stop doing it, you can make amends, you can buy them some milk. If you're stealing your colleague's milk and you say to yourself, I'm a bad, ethical, immoral person, it's a lot more difficult to shift your self-concept and change who you are. Another thing that's important to consider are the things that trigger shame. What triggers shame in the intensity is different for every person based on our experiences. So what is shameful for me as a New England Catholic from a conservative family, okay, is gonna be different from people based on a lot of other experiences. And that's where it can be difficult to come in and give some empathy. You're thinking, that doesn't bother me. 
it bothers that person. And a little, this really has stuck with me as well. Shaming another in public is like shedding blood. And if we've ever ourselves been shamed in public or watched it happen, we know either empathetically or ourselves what that feeling is like. So it's worth thinking about, you know, how that shame makes us feel. And I can't really talk about it today, there's not much time, but doing a process of cognitive <coughs> review. What it is about is actually taking a hold of that feeling, okay, and exploring it and not pushing it away. So the example that I give is a few years ago, I did some CBT um, around anxiety. So I had a lot of bereavements in one short space, and anxiety is a response to bereavement. Um, and my therapist said to me, you know, wh what does it feel like? And I said, it feels like two magnets of opposing, um, you know, charge, thank you, you know, in, in my stomach. And he said, well, what are you trying to do with that feeling? And I said, well, obviously I try and push it away. I don't want to feel uncomfortable. And he said, well, what if you took hold of that feeling, grabbed hold of it and explored it and did something with it if you accepted that feeling? Um, and I, I do that now, and I think it's a turning point in my life to actually begin to accept feelings, to explore them. And now when I get that feeling, rather than feeling anxious and horrible, I kind of get a little bit excited because I think I'm about to learn something. Something in my life is about to change <coughs> or shift. And something that can help us, this is called the compass of shame, which was put together by a psychologist <coughs> called Nathanson in 1992. And I'm just going to focus on these two sides. Withdrawal can be a useful short-term strategy, and that's temporarily removing yourself from a situation that has happened to reduce the intensity of the experience. So if someone says, I need a little bit of space, the risk is, is you actually push the experience away, you deny it, and then someone accumulates these layers of shame, and they become a burden. There's no opportunity to learn, there's no opportunity to make amends and discharge. And those feelings might come back and surprise us at a later time. Um, acceptance is the one that I want to focus on, on today um, in the little time that we have left. I thought this was getting a bit heavy, so I thought I could put this <laughs> potato in. Mm. I started it late. <laughs> acceptance is the most practical, probably the most difficult to apply, because it requires a lot of a lot of self-awareness and the development and use of coping strategies. And it can, it can rely on a good support network as well. Um, so I think there are things like owning your failures, all right, owning your mistakes, laughing um, at them. I'm gonna, that's the one I'm going to focus on. Changing or learning from our mistakes, so making some sort of progress as a result of them. And then ultimately letting it go, so not ruminating and worrying over these things. So one of the things that I share with my students I used to be a fantastic baseball fan when I was growing up in America. And um, Ozzie Smith was a fantastic player. He was top of his game. He failed two thirds of the time in his job, like all good base play baseball players do. But I remember reading something he wrote when I was 12. And he said, and I still use this today, someone said, how do you cope with all that failure? And he said, I just think that in six million years, when the uh, Earth is an ice ball hurtling through space, Nobody's going to care that Ozzie Smith struck out in the bottom of the ninth with four men on, on base and, and two outs. And that kind of existential absurdity touched me when I was 12. And I use that to this day, because I thought, even if I come here today in a completely bomb, you know, <coughs> in six million years, none of you are going to remember me or care. <laughs> okay? So find your own talisman. Find a way of, 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 of dealing with it, it, the existential absurdity. And I just want to leave you with a few thoughts with from Michael Desmond about, about comedy. And I like this ancient Greek um, depiction of comedy because it, it shows the sort of ambiguity between tragedy and comedy. Um, and I don't want to reinvent the wheel because I think Michael Desmond puts this perfectly. Some think of comedy as tragedy's antithesis, one light, the other serious, but it too is a way of dealing with failure. Comedy shows our absurdity as coming to nothing, shows being human as risible. It brings down stronger, explodes pretension, dissolving in laughter the constriction of being that failure brings. Failure is not ultimately serious. What it, what it is, is the ultimate sheer energy of being that laughter discloses. Laughter is self-forgetting, Olympian, godlike redeeming. It makes failure inconsequential. It too is nothing, and where failure cannot be healed, laughter at least makes us forget it. Comedy is a kind of metaphysical co commentary on finiteness and failure. We will always and inevitably failure, fail. 
Sometimes we laugh at failure, sometimes at it, sometimes with bitterness, sometimes more gently. But laughter can be that healing, let it be, let it go. There is something absolutely elemental about laughing. It reveals an essential promise of being human. For a defeated, disappointed self finds it extremely difficult to laugh. To laugh would be to destroy the disappointment, and this we strangely hug. It would be to unlock the flow of energy that the disappointment of failure congeals. In laughter, we briefly taste the return of the finite, the irrepressible energy and the energy of being that unfailingly plays a subversive comedy. Thank you.